Well, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 15th meeting in 2013 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee and the last meeting prior to the summer recess. <coughs> Members are reminded to switch off all mobile devices as they affect the broadcasting system, although uh, some members of the committee may consult tablets during the meeting. Um, there are apologies from Adam Ingram um, and Gil Patterson has been delayed in an overrun of the Health and Sport um, Committee. <coughs> the agenda item one is items in private and I seek the agreement of the committee to take item five in private to allow the committee to consider its work programme. That is agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is sustainable, the state sustainable housing strategy and today we'll hear evidence from the Minister for Housing and Welfare on the sustainable housing strategy. So can I welcome Margaret Burgess, Minister for Housing and Welfare, David Fotheringham, Team Leader, Housing Sustainability and Innovative Funding Division, Andy Robinson, Head of Home Energy Efficiency Programmes Area Based Schemes, Stephen Scott, Principal Architect, Building Standards Division, Scottish Government, and Valerie Snedden, Team Leader of Housing Stock Quality and Private Sector Climate Change Regulation. Can I welcome you all and invite you, Minister, to make an opening statement. We thank you, Convener, <coughs> uh, for giving, inviting me to talk about Scotland's Sustainable Housing Strategy, which was launched on Friday. I think at the start I would emphasise that the strategy was developed with a major input from the Sustainable Housing Strategy Group, which was made up of stakeholders from housing, fuel poverty, the environment and consumer protection, and it builds on the major consultation exercise we undertook last year. The strategy sets out a vision for everyone in Scotland to have the opportunity to live in a warm, high-quality, affordable, low-carbon home. It's an ambitious strategy, but it's a way of meeting the needs of people in fuel poverty and our commitments in climate change. There's also real opportunity to create jobs in the low-carbon economy. And as energy prices continue to rise, the Scottish Government uh, is making substantial um, sustainable housing a high priority, and we need to reduce people's energy bills and carbon emissions. And with the current powers of this devolved Parliament, the only way we can do it is by improving energy efficiency. We've already made considerable progress, and since 2008, over one in five households in Scotland have received free or subsidised insulation for their lofts or cavity walls. But that's not enough, and more needs to be done. And we're building on the success through our home energy efficiency programmes for Scotland, or HEAPS for short. And this is the Scottish Government's national programme for retrofitting Scotland's housing stock helping those in need to heat their homes for less. So despite the Westminster cuts to the Scottish Government's capital budget, we're investing £79 million in heaps. We aim to make Scotland attractive for the energy companies to meet their energy company obligation, creating a £200 million annual investment that will also create jobs across Scotland. The strategy recognises the needs to consider minimum energy efficiency standards for our existing private sector homes and a working group is now in place to develop that. We are working with the Scottish Housing Regulator to ensure that all social housing meets the Scottish Housing Quality Standard by 2015, and later this year we will publish the new Energy Efficiency Standard for Social Housing, setting out the first milestones for 2020. And we also want to transfer in the market for sustainable housing. We want people to think about energy efficiency when they choose their home they're going to buy or rent. And in response to a European directive, we recently introduced legislation which requires the energy performance of homes to be included in adverts. And it's important to build with the, on this, and we'll work with lenders and surveyors to look at the evidence and move the market for more sustainable homes. But it is our existing homes that form the bulk of our housing stock, and it's right that this has to be our priority. And we also need to consider new homes we build and the legacy that they represent. So alongside proposals for further improvement to energy performance through our building regulations, we want to work with the industry to make sure that the innovative design and construction techniques being developed here in Scotland deliver more sustainable homes and create export and other economic opportunities. And we already announced £13.5 million investment in greener homes to use modern construction methods over, and this will build us over 300 affordable homes. But it's not right that an energy-rich nation such as Scotland 
uh, people are still struggling to pay their fuel bills. And this strategy does set out our vision how we will help people reduce their fuel bills, focusing on those most in need to tackle fuel poverty and also to reduce our carbon, carbon emissions. And I'm happy now to answer questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Minister. And if I can start off, um, <clears throat> during the discussions around RPP2, the Scottish Government emphasised the importance of levering in funding through schemes such as the energy company obligation. Could you provide an update on the most recent interactions with the obligated utility companies in terms of working with the Scottish Government and local authorities? I think in terms of the, the utility companies, officials meet with them um, on a regular basis, um, I think twice a year bilaterally, but we also meet collectively through quarterly meetings with, with the officials. But the three biggest utility companies that we work with, uh, Scottish Gas, Scottish Power and SSE, are all members of the uh, Fuel Poverty Forum. And it may at last in June, in fact, I think last week, the 18th of June, um, and they were discussing the eco-obligations and how it's going to be delivered. So there is you know, regular interaction with the companies. Uh, you know, we're confident that they want to work with us and we want to work with them to ensure that we can get the, the most out of them. Um, and I think it's hoped that with energy supplier funding, the Scottish Government will be able to deliver around a total of 200 million annual expenditure. Could you provide details on the level of funding Scotland has received from energy companies so far? Well, the, the way it's working has been monitored now is that with the HEAPS programme, the, the, the money the Scottish Government has, has put into it, local authorities have now submitted that money, has now been distributed to, to local authorities, and they um, are working up programmes with the energy companies to, for the schemes that they're producing. And in doing that, um, so far, they, they're telling us that for the money that we've allocated so far, that they, they hope to bring in £125 million. Uh, now, that, that's the figure that they're working on in terms of the schemes that they're putting together, and that's not using all of the, the £60 million for heaps. So we're quite confident that we're going to make that because the other affordable warmth and the other schemes, the energy assistance package, all of those schemes um, attract energy company obligation. So at the moment, uh, you know, we think we're, we're on track for that. And if the previous schemes that we had under the CERT scheme, um, the Scottish, Scottish programmes, we had 540,000 households uh, got measures installed, over 600,000 measures, and that we got more than our share of CERT, you know, per, per, percentage of population, I think 9.4% of the population and 10.4% uh, of the CERT, uh, CERT uh, Allocation, so we're confident that we'll still get our share or more than our share of that from the energy companies. I think that's only right, isn't it? Because the uh, we're a few degrees colder. Absolutely. Um, uh, anyway, but you mentioned the three major companies, but we had a submission uh, from Colour Gas, and uh, in the consultation that preceded the uh, strategy. Uh, the Scottish Government asked the specific question regarding how to improve energy efficiency in relation to rural areas, uh, obviously most, if not all, uh, off-grid. Um, but that issue doesn't seem to have been clearly continued into the strategy document. Can you explain why this As is I the case? I think the strategy is looking at all of Scotland and every house in Scotland having fuel poverty measures installed, and we are looking at different ways. I mean... We started out doing the, the, easy, the easier measures, which we knew you get volume done and that was easier to do. We're moving on now to the harder to, to treat properties, uh, which cost more and are harder to treat. And, the, and we are looking at the rural areas. I think the Fuel Poverty Group, perhaps David might want to say a bit more about that, but the Fuel Poverty Forum are well aware of the issues in rural areas and the challenges that we face there. But the, the strategy is for the whole of Scotland and not, not leaving out any rural area. And all the, the rural 
councils have received their share of the HEAPS funding as well, and we'll be working up their programmes for that. I don't know if you would like to comment more on that, David. Uh, yeah, just briefly, I mean, um, the Minister just made the point I was going to make that, that the all 32 local authorities uh, have been awarded allocations under the, the HEAP scheme, so it really will be right across the country, and the local authorities, um, uh, you know, have a lot of... Um, discretion about the the areas that they, they, they target, focusing on the fuel poor areas. Um, and the other thing that, to highlight is that under the um, energy company obligation, under the, uh, the affordable warmth element of that, there is a, a specific sort of rural element within that to try and make sure that, that, that some of the eco is targeted uh, on rural areas. So I think with the combination of, of funding, um, that should help to address some of the problems faced in rural areas. Margaret, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, just in the back of that. A property can't be carbon efficient if the property doesn't meet other criteria, like the windows are needing fixed, the doors are needing fixed, the roof's in disrepair. What is the government doing to encourage property owners to actually build those properties up to an acceptable level of being carbon efficient? Because there's no much point putting in cavity wall insulation and roof insulation if all the rest of the property is needing repair as well? I think, uh, to start with, an assessment would be carried out before to determine what insulation measures are required, which can include, in some instances, double glazing or windows. But obviously the general repair of, of properties is something that we've been looked at. We're currently looking at that. We're looking at that through the private um, sector strategy in terms of housing repairs and even considering looking at in the housing bill whether or not we need to give local authorities more power to ensure that properties are up to a tolerable standard. But in terms of the, the, the carbon measures, that would there would be an assessment carried out to see what could be done. But clearly, if, if fitting double glazed windows to walls that were going to fall in would, would not meet the criteria. Um, so that's part of the overall house condition strategy that we're looking at. OK, thank you. Elaine? Yes, um, <coughs> in terms of the, the, uh, <coughs> the funding which you've, you say has already been allocated to local authorities, what was the criteria in which, in which those were allocated? Is it on the basis of bids? Is it on the basis of an assessment of the degree of fuel poverty and so right. on? I think, to, to start with, it, it was a formula that was agreed with COSLA of how we, we distribute it. And it's written down, I'll have to kind of look. It was, but the number of fuel, fuel poor households in the, the, the local authority area, the percentage of the population that's, that's fuel poor, the, the percentage of share of dwellings uh, which have solid walls, so the sort of hard to treat properties, uh, and also the hard to treat cavity walls. So there was a figure set aside uh, based on that formula for every local authority, and that was announced with the, the strategy when I launched it. We announced the amount that each local authority uh, area will get. That took up £46 million, if I'm, I'm right here. And the, the balance of the money, the balance of the £60 million for the heaps, the area-based uh, part, local authorities can apply for additional funds if they work up the programme. And so, therefore, local authorities know the amount they've been allocated, and then they work up to what they feel and what they've negotiated with the energy companies to bring in for their particular scheme. So it's then down to the local authority to determine what area they, they tackle first in terms of how they spend that money. It's a local authority decision. It's not been part of a bidding process. No, it's the, the local authorities for, for that part of the 46 million part of the heaps. And I think the formula also included they couldn't get any less than 10% of the, the UHIS money that they previously had because some local authorities were planning uh, forward. So they then come in with their projects and how they're going to, do, you know, what they're going to do with their projects, because different local authorities, obviously, uh, de determining local circumstances, and I think that covers some of the rural issues as well. And do you have any idea what sort of timescale there would be in terms of people knowing? I think certainly what I've detected, people knew what the previous scheme was. Nobody's quite sure what the new scheme is. There's a bit of a hiatus at the moment where people aren't quite sure how they would qualify to be on the new scheme. And do you have any idea of what sort of time time scale? That I think all local authorities have put in. Um, right, seeing this, uh, they've, they've given in bids. I mean, I, I think I've got some examples on, on the, the, the table that, for example, I mean, Glasgow got the, the highest percentage, and I think Aberdeenshire was the second highest, and, and their bids include its cavity wall loft, solid wall insulation, 
um, external insulation. Aberdeen, I think they're doing boilers. So it's what's required in their area within what they, they need to try and meet their obligation. And obviously they choose the areas that they're going to do it in. So there are some when, that, when, when the programme will actually start, get any, any sort of indication from the local authorities when the programme will actually start to roll out? The, 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 you know, Andy, you want to? Yes, thanks. I, I mean, I can probably give you some information. The, um, the local authorities were, in, were advised of how much funding they received in the first round uh, just last week. So we would expect them to be now starting to put, put measures in place on the ground. Some of them will be in the middle of uh, procurement processes. Some of them have already done their procurement. So it's likely that they'll start contacting households in selected areas very soon, I would imagine, in the next few weeks. Uh, Jim. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, Minister and panel. Um, Minister, you've set out a very ambitious programme for home energy efficiency in the sustainable housing strategy and alluded in your introductory remarks to the opportunities that that provides for reducing our carbon emissions and uh, also for promoting sustainable economic growth and employment. Uh, but I'd like to ask you about, given that that will create opportunities for a larger number of uh, homes that are eligible for home insulation and energy efficiency, how do we protect the public from unscrupulous companies, some of whom will claim to be local authority and Scottish Government accredited when they are not, and so therefore what sanctions are there available to um, against companies that behave uh, irresponsibly, and what role is there for, a trusted, for the trusted trader scheme um, that will be developed and administered at a local authority level? I think I would make it clear that the trusted trader scheme is not something that we were anticipating setting up as a national scheme of trusted traders. We, we would intend to do this, use this locally where there have been local traders used, where consumer um, advice centres and local authorities have worked with, with traders in the past. They know the local traders in their area that can be trusted. And most of the, the schemes are being administered, certainly the, 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 the government schemes are being administered through the Energy Savings um, Trust and the Energy Advice Centres. And the Energy Advice Centres will also be building up with the individuals and with the local authorities, the, the traders that, that are to be trusted. Also within the Energy Advice Centres, they're looking at going out there into communities, talking to um, ho hospitals, home helps, getting out there into service, getting the message across uh, to ensure that people are not being um, duped by unscrupulous traders. It has been a, a, I know there's been a lot of concern about the phone calls, etc., that people are receiving, and so we're, we're, we're looking very closely at that, and it is something that the energy advice centres are very aware of and certainly our emphasis on to ensure that everybody uses the, the Scottish Government help line, goes through the Energy Advice Centre. All of the referrals that we make will be, or that the centres make, will be done that way, and they will assist the individuals get a trusted and a, a trader that the local authority is happy with in their area. I mean, obviously, there's a shared desire to protect the public, and particularly older people and vulnerable people. But what steps are we taking to make sure that those people have the information that they need that we're disseminating uh, the help line number uh, to those households? And, and going back to my original question, what sanctions are available um, against those companies that behave irresponsibly? I'll, I'll go back to your first part to, to start with. Um, and I think what I was trying to say not very clearly is that in terms of vulnerable people, we're clear the energy advice centres are now doing outreach services and intend to deliver over 750 this coming year. And those are not just outreach services to individuals uh, going along for advice. It's about going out and talking to groups that are in contact with vulnerable people, uh, whether it be home helps, care services, um, Macmillan, all of those groups uh, there's been um, the energy advice centres are talking to them about how to make the referrals and if they can even identify people that should be referred to ensure that they are not being um, having tradespeople that are not 
legit, if we want to use that 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 word for it, um, and therefore that that's the way of getting that way. In terms of the sanctions that can be taken, maybe I don't know if anybody can pass that on, but presumably Benny. Um, yes, in, in terms of, of, uh, of sanctions, I mean, you, you, you're right, it, it is very difficult. I mean, if, if, if people are literally turning up on the doorstep and misrepresenting themselves and saying they work for the government when, when they don't, uh, that really is a matter for local authority um, trading standards uh, officials. Um, if there's any energy company implications, uh, implication uh, that they're connected with this, then ultimately that's uh, down to Ofgem, and there have been examples in the past where Ofgem has fined energy companies for sort of inappropriate uh, sort of selling in certain situations. Um, but I think the, the, the thing that we've heard more about, is, as you say, is just a sort of uh, individual person turning up on the door and uh, mis misrepresenting themselves, and we would like to see you know, the local councils taking strong action on that. Okay, thank you. Elaine, did you want to come back up? <coughs> Thanks. Um, to the, the, in terms of people who are most vulnerable to full, uh, fuel poverty, uh, people like older, people pensioners, uh, people with disabilities and so on are more vulnerable. And I wonder if you could explain how within an area-based scheme where you're looking at areas where there are problems, overall problems with fuel poverty, how the HEAP scheme particularly can assist individuals within the Scotland who have particular vulnerabilities towards fuel, fuel poverty? I think, as you say, the, the HEAP scheme is area-based and, and local authorities will determine the area based on that criteria that I set out. But there's also the Affordable Warm Scheme and the Energy Assistance Scheme, which will look at targeting vulnerable individuals. And again, that's where the Energy Advice Centres play an important part in identifying vulnerable people who may be eligible. And the Affordable Warmth is, is for, for homeowners as well, and it's for all of Scotland, and that's a, that's a UK scheme. Um, we also have the Energy Assistance Scheme, which we extended here in Scotland and put a further uh, £16 million pounds into to ensure that we're still, there's nobody missing out as much as possible. So we anticipate more people will now uh, get measures installed that are under the previous um, just energy assistance package with the two schemes running together, we anticipate more vulnerable people than previously will be assisted. Can you maybe say a little bit more about what the criteria are now are for the new energy assistance scheme? Which right, the, en the affordable warm scheme is the, the UK wide scheme and it is for it is affecting people in, in certain benefits, pension credits and um, child tax credit certain vulnerable people over certain ages with a disability and that's the affordable warm scheme and out the energy assistance scheme adds to that with people we have included in it people who um terminally ill i think carers maybe and andy i don't know yeah, if you've got right. others carers yeah uh, people terminally ill people over 75 whose boiler is is no longer working am i correct low, incomes, yeah. low income and boiler not working so it's to try and get as many people in, in this as possible <clears throat> And we certainly are satisfied. Well, we are happy that our scheme is covering more people than than any other scheme in the UK. That that's um, been continued for two years. Are there any plans that that will continue after the two years? That, that, that will be reviewed uh, as we go on. But it's two years currently we're looking at, and with a review at the end of that. Thanks. Okay, uh, Margaret. Uh, yeah, uh, the Scottish Government plans to make it easier and safer for older people to access any equity in their homes to meet their own housing needs and maintain independent living. Can you expand on the Scottish Government's plans and how it will support older people to access the equity in their homes? I think a couple of things there. The, the, the sustainable housing strategy is concentrates on the, the, the energy efficiency and the housing standards. Um, the equity release um, that we're looking at is about adaptations for, for homes for the elderly and how we're looking at working up a scheme that people who, who want to proactively adapt their home uh, for their, their, to remain in the home that they're in. Uh, so that's currently being worked up just now. We're also looking at that in conjunction with our new, you know, the home adaptation scheme. We've involved, we had a, a meeting, I think, recently with Age Scotland as well to look at their input. They were anxious to have some input into the home equity release scheme. So that's currently being worked on. It is, it is work in progress, but it's not at a final stage yet. 
wonder, Minister, what was the rationale behind uh, the strategy focusing on energy efficiency rather than outlining a more comprehensive approach to housing sustainability, you know, including adaptations? I think all of those things are part of the overall vision. And I think there's a number of, there's a number of strands to the, the overall vision of the, the housing policy. I mean, for example, we have our older person strategy, which will focus on the adaptations and, and the need for people to stay in, in their own home. And also the overall, you know, aim of the, the, the vision uh, that everyone should live in a house that's warm, you know, comfortable and suitable for their needs. And the suitable, that is, that's an overall vision that all the strategies sit under. So, uh, you know, I think it's not, they're not one thing doesn't exclude the other. It's, it's looking at the different strands of it. The older age one focuses on older, you know, older people. Um, I think maybe, um, Stephen, you might want to say something about the, the building standards, how we're looking at building lifelong homes for life. Uh, Certainly, uh, since 2007, we've incorporated lifetime homes principles into building regulations for new homes, looking at flexibility of accommodation, making sure we have accessible sanitary accommodation, really with the idea that people can live in their homes longer. And that, again, is something I think we're, we're leading the UK in. Uh, we also have our Section 7 within the building regulations on sustainability, which again looks at uh, carbon dioxide emissions, energy use, but also broader issues such as flexibility of accommodation, uh, material use such as space for recycling, issues such as that. Uh, so I think new homes are, are relatively well served in that respect. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, previous consultations have uh, put a focus on improving the sustainability of private sector housing. And the statement uh, makes uh, the strategy states that the Scottish Government has set up a working group to develop proposals for minimum energy efficiency standards in private sector housing. Uh, could I ask the Minister to provide further details on the role in the remit to the private sector working group and when you expect it to report? Private sector working group, I think, has met twice. Once it's met, it's met twice so far. Um, we we would expect it to come forward with recommendations, and we would then go out to consultation. I think that the plan is to cons consult in 2015, uh, with a view to bringing any regulation in by 2018. That's the current plan. The group may come up with a different focus, but th that that's what we're, we're aiming for at the moment. There's uh, been a previous commitment to encourage homeowners in mixed tenure and shared ownership properties to improve and maintain their properties to, set, uh, to the set condition standard. Uh, can you give me uh, some indication of how that is to be achieved? I think that comes into a question I think I answered earlier, I think, for, for, for Margaret McCullough, um, that we are looking at introducing something in the, the housing bill if necessary to ensure that, we, I mean, obviously we're encouraging people in mixed tenure properties to do the repairs according to their title deeds, if they're shared according to the title deeds, and to look at whether or not local authorities uh, could use their powers more effectively, or whether they need more powers to try and encourage that to happen. Um, we, you know, we are aware that there's issues with, have been issues with that, but the standard, if we introduce minimum standards, they will apply across the board to um, all owner property and home ownership. Are you confident that where there are mixed tenure uh, blocks or shared ownership properties uh, involved that the structure of uh, grants and support that's available is flexible enough to deal with these situations or are there any uh, voids in the, the cover that will endanger the opportunity I mean, to get certainly funding? That, that's something that will be looked at in the group will report on. In terms of sustainability and sustainable housing, the HEAPS programme, that, that's one of the advantages of the HEAPS programme uh, when houses in an area, an area-based scheme, are being um, cavity wall or, or external wall insulation, it covers the homeowners as well. The affordable warmth covers that. But in terms of the general repairs, that we are, we are looking at that, but the responsibility of homeowners in keeping their house up to a reasonable standard or a tolerable, a beyond tolerable standard, and also looking at what will be included in that, and ensuring that local authorities are in, local authorities encourage the homeowners that, to do it, let them know what is required, but 
it's very early stages at this yet, I would have to Will say. that cover the notorious situation where a single homeowner on a block is the, the blockage towards progress? It, it will cover it in terms of the, the sustainability, but again, the, the, the reality is if someone says, even if, if we're doing the, the external wall insulation, if someone says, I don't want that in my property, no, I don't think that would cover that unless, Valerie, you would like to... Yeah, to that. yeah, just to pick up on something the Minister said earlier about um, part of the consultation did include proposals to extend local authorities' existing powers, and um, that is something that ministers are thinking about at the moment. And it, you know, and whether that sort of that blocking that, that missing shares issue was one of the things that we did consult on. Um, I think obviously the the issue of repair is separate but linked to energy efficiency, and local authorities do have flexible powers at the moment to, to provide to, to discretionary assistance for repairs. Um, but it is very much the, the homeowner's responsibility to look after their properties. Um, and, you know, we, we, would, we encourage local authorities to use their powers where they can to encourage people to, you know, carry out the work that they are due to do. So basically, we all need to monitor the situation. It's all our responsibility to bring forward the, the possible situations that need remedies. It will be monitored. Mm -hmm. Margaret? <coughs> Fifteen? Can you tell me when the regulatory impact assessment in the new energy efficiency standards for social housing will be published? We would intend to publish that along with the, the re report. Is that when we would intend to do that? We'd intend to publish that at the same time. Um, <coughs> It will be alongside, published alongside the standard when we publish it in autumn. It's, it's currently underway just now. So that's when we would intend to, to publish that. Is it possible also to comment how a single condition standard for all tenures would, it, would interact with the planned social and private housing standard? There's very little I can say in that because it's at very, very early stages. So at this stage, no, it's, it's, it's too early to comment on that. Okay. Gordon? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one relates to um, the affordable housing supply programme. Uh, in, the, in the report it says we will continue to provide an extra £4,000 funding through the affordable housing supply programme for every home meeting the silver sustainable standard for emissions and energy, energy use. Can you tell us how many homes are currently meeting the silver sustainability standard for emissions and energy use and how do we encourage greater take-up? I think, well, the, the, the standards uh, came into effect in, in 2011, in May 2011, and it applies to new buildings. Um, so the, the Scottish Housing Condition Survey relates to 2011, so we don't have... Um, data on that just now as a whole, but we are encouraging people, as you rightly said, in terms of the £4,000 uh, additional subsidy to build a greener home. We also have um, the Greener Homes Investment Programme that we, we announced £13.5 million earlier in the year to build 330 homes using green techniques and t technologies and encourage people to look at those properties, to see the advantages of those properties, and just try and encourage them to do that. But certainly it's early stages to give actual numbers on the silver standard just now. Yeah. Thank you, um, thank you Convener. Minister, can I ask you about the, um, the milestones um, for 2020 that are outlined both in the strategy and as part of the report and proposals and policies? Uh, there are three key um, milestones, ambitious in nature. Every home to have loft and cavity wall insulation, where that's technically feasible. Every house with gas central heating to have a highly efficient boiler. And at least 100,000 homes to have adopted uh, some form of individual or community renewable heat technology for space and or water heating. How confident are you that the government can meet these ambitious targets? I think we are monitoring that, and we, we, they are ambitious, but we, we are fairly confident that we can meet them, and uh, that, that's being monitored. I think we, we laid that out in response to the... after the last uh, time I attended the committee, 
and we've made that clear that we, we think that we can meet those targets and uh, that's certainly what we're aiming for. I'd like a little bit more detail perhaps from officials on what the, the process is and what mechanisms are in place to make sure that we're making progress on a year-by-year -year basis towards the 2020 right. target. David, do you want to pick that one up? Um, yes, uh, I mean the, the, the main source of information uh, for monitoring progress on that is the Scottish House Condition Survey that the Minister mentioned. Um, the, the latest data on, on that is from 2011 and we'll get the 2012 data later on this year. Uh, and uh, in the back of the, the sustainable housing strategy we've got an annex which sets out the, the, the progress uh, up, to, up to that point. And um, you know, without going through that, I think we, we, we've on the loft and cavities we've had uh, a really good boost with the, the CERT program. And the minister mentioned the figures earlier on uh, about that uh, 629,000 measures under the CERT program, which has really helped to boost loft and cavities. Uh, we had the boiler scrappage scheme, which has really been helped with the um, with the boiler replacement. Anticipating my next question, because I, I recognise. Um, as your answer has just illustrated, the progress that has been made, particularly mm. in relation to home and loft insulation, and you've mentioned the 600,000 plus figure, which relates to 500,000 homes, <coughs> and the progress that's been made in terms of um, boiler replacements. But when we come to the, the third target, which is the um, 100,000 homes to have adopted some form of renewable heat technology, micro renewables, if you like, in many cases, we only have a, around 13,000 homes at the moment, is that right? So is, is that the scale of the challenge that faces us, 13,000 now as against 100,000 that we want to achieve by 2020? Um, well, that, that was a figure in, in 2010. Um, so I think we would have, uh, we, and, and so there's, there's some more detail given there about the figures for 2011. So I think we are seeing uh, gradual progress there. Got, but is that the scale of the challenge we're facing or not? Well, I think, I mean, um, the Minister doesn't lead on the renewable heat side of things, but, uh, but we, we do know that the, um, the renewable heat vision um, does set out sort of very ambitious sort of policies to, to drive the uptake of renewable heat. So I think what we can say is, is that, you know, the, the sustainable <coughs> housing strategy shows the progress that we've made to date, you know, and things are improving. And there's also a determination to, uh, to, to, to drive renewable heat further through the, through the heat vision. All right, so the 13,000 figure, when will we get an update on that? If that was 2010, when's the...? Well, the, the, there is an, an update uh, in, the, in the table for 2011, uh, and there's some so figures... What, right, so what's the figure then? Um, the figure there from the SHCS um, estimated that around 20,000 homes use solar thermal panels, biomass fuel or heat pumps by the end of 2011. So, you know, that, that's progress again okay. on the previous year, obviously. All right. My final question is, what, what more do we need to do to make sure that we're on, on course to hit that 100,000 target? The renewable, well, as has been pointed out, it's not me that leads on renewable heat. That's uh, the, the energy minister that's on renewable heat, and there's a number of schemes in place to encourage that and to ensure that we're encouraging renew renewable heating methods. And there's quite a lot of discussion ongoing on that just now. So the hope is, that, or the intention is, that we will reach the, reach the target. I mean, I will, yeah. But I could uh, just add to that is that the um, Scottish Government has recently published uh, a draft outline heat vision and draft heat deployment options guidance. Um, and uh, over the coming year, uh, we'll develop a new heat generation policy statement. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this, this is, you know, the, the work that's being done to, to take forward the work on renewable heat. Um, and of course, we've got the programmes like the renewable heat incentive and the renewable heat um, premium payment schemes uh, around as well. <coughs> Gordon, did you want to come up? Yeah, I was wanting to ask another quick question about uh, training and skills development. On page 12 of the report it says we will continue to support demand-led training through our national training programmes, further and higher education programmes and our low carbon skills fund to ensure that employers have a skilled and competent workforce needed to meet current and future standards. However, on page 14, uh, a response from consultation says it was argued that the current state of the construction industry makes it more difficult to contemplate innovation or speculative investment in training and skills development. How, how do we square those two opposing views and 
Is there anything the government can do to, to try and help resolve that? I think what we, we're committed to, obviously, promoting training opportunities and skills development, and the knowledge in terms of the sector is increasing considerably. That's why we are where we are uh, today with, with, with the, the innovative methods that are being used in Scotland. And yes, we're encouraging that every way we can, and skills development are looking at that. There are also a number of other areas, I think, um, the Resource Centre for Women in Science, Engineering and Technology is running a project to, to look at this as well because there's a recognition there's perhaps not enough women uh, involved in the construction industry to look at sort of equality and diversity measures and also that includes the training that's involved in that. So yes, we are aware of that and we are looking at improving that. We know it's not quite where it should be. Right, thanks. Minister, I understand that the Scottish Government is going to be working with Glasgow Solicitors Property Centre and Glasgow University through the 2020 Built Environment Subgroup to track home buyers' appetite towards energy efficiency. And I think this is the elephant in the room, basically, because um, I don't think... You, you know, you mentioned the, the home energy report that's now required... Um, but um, there needs to be more engagement with lenders and consumers and surveyors, and I would add lawyers and property agents uh, to um, include a valuation premium on energy efficiency measures. I mean, I just don't think it registers on the psyche of homeowners present to think about the energy efficiency and the savings that could be made on current expenditure if the house was um, uh, really energy efficient and I just wondered how we how we engage with people to put that further up the agenda. I think uh, as you pointed out yourself convener that there is work ongoing just now with the Glasgow Solicitors the Property Centre and Glasgow University and we would also we would be looking at that um, I think there is, there is an issue there about how, how we do get the public to recognise the, the value of energy efficiency measures in their home. But there has been some research recently from DEC, which was in England only, but it is showing a link between energy efficiency and the value of homes. So we're, we're very interested in that and going to be following that through and see, you know, look at more detail on what's happening with that. Um, but I think uh, there is more that we need to do. I, I really think that when people have had energy emissions installed, they are looking mainly at the, the savings the co of their, their electricity or gas or whatever savings. So we are looking at that to try and encourage people to say there should be a premium when they, they um, buy a home, a green premium, whatever it wants to be called. But there is work to be done in that. I don't think we're... Um, actually at that stage yet. But the, the research is quite interesting. It's come out from DEC and it's just recently published, I think David had stuff on it there. But uh, th there's some interesting information in that that we want to look at in more detail and see if we can use that, that here in Scotland to encourage people. Um, I think the James Hutton Institute was also involved in a, an international, well, pan-European project called Gilded uh, on people's attitudes to, to home energy efficiency, you might want to, to contact them as well. Um, has anyone else got any further questions? Any further comments, Minister? No, I, I think that that's, unless no one's got any questions, I'm... Okay. Well, thank you very much, Minister and your officials, um, for that uh, session. And I now briefly uh, suspend to allow the witnesses to leave the room.
Okay, the <laughs> third uh, agenda item three today is subordinate legislation. Uh, we are asked to consider a negative instrument on mobile homes written agreements as listed on the agenda. These, recommend these regulations amend the specified information which the site owner must supply to the proposed occupier of the mobile home. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform, known as DPLR Committee, determined that it did not need to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament. The Committee is invited to consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on the instrument. Uh, members should note that there have been no motions to annul received in relation to this instrument. Does anyone have any comments? I think we discussed this last week. So, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? That is agreed. Thank you. Agenda item four is a legislative consent memorandum. Uh, it's to consider an LCM on the High Speed Rail Preparation Bill, which is UK Parliament legislation. Because the High Speed Rail P Preparation Bill covers some devolved areas, the consent of the Scottish Parliament is required before it can progress at Westminster. Uh, paper 3 in our papers today includes the LCM and provides details of the LCM procedure. Uh, so the committee is invited to consider whether a um, uh, report that the committee is content with the LCM and with the Scottish Government's view that the Scottish Parliament should consent to the UK Parliament legislating in this area. Or, that, or report that the committee notes the LCM. Yes? Uh, I'm just going to say that my views concur concisely with those of the Scottish Government. <laughs> Good. Does, <laughs> does everybody else's? <laughs> does it matter whether we... Yeah, we just agree to report to the Parliament on that basis. Yeah. Okay, so we... Uh, bullet point one that, that we report that the committee is content with the LCM and with the Scottish Government's view that the Scottish Parliament should consent to the UK Parliament legislating in this area. Is that agreed? Okay. Um, at this point, the committee will move into private as previously agreed. <laughs> 